Welcome back to another one of my favorite places to fish and look at geology. Today I'm at Flaming Gorge Reservoir. I'm just over the Wyoming border. I'm in Utah. Wyoming is less than a mile that way. And Flaming Gorge is a spectacular place to look at rocks. Best of all, the highway department in Wyoming and Utah have placed um, signs along each of the outcrops because everything here is pretty much tilting uniformly to the north. So as you drive to the south, you get progressively older and older and older rocks. We wind up in the Precambrian. But every few miles, there's a sign that has some interesting little tidbit, like the name of the formation, and then something about the depositional environment, and also a little bit of trivia. So they'll say something like the Nugget Sandstone, Windblown Dunes, Dinosaurs Left Their Tracks Here, stuff like that. So generally, you can get a pretty good feel for where you are in the stratigraphic column by looking at these signs, except in a few cases, like one I found the other day that had me scratching my head, um, I want to go back and take a look at it. I'm inviting you to come along because I think things aren't right with at least one of these signs. I've got a funny feeling there's something wrong today. So as I mentioned, not all these signs appear to be 100% correct. And the reason I say that is on the skyline behind me, you'll see two big cliff forming sands. There's a lower one and an upper one. The lower one is a beautiful set of sandstone parasequences. So they're wave dominated deltaic shore faces that are building out to the east from the west. So you actually see them pinch out. The lower one actually pinches out completely, just like you see in the textbook. Rare to actually see that in exposure, but there it is. Because everything is dipping to the north, you would expect things stratigraphically on top of that unit to be younger. So that shore face unit is Cretaceous, maybe about 77, 75, somewhere in there. You'd expect the rock on top of it to be younger, and then you expect it to be tertiary up above, Paleocene. And it, it is, in fact. The problem is the highway sign on that sand body right there suggests it's something else. It suggests it's Triassic or Jurassic, which is mind blowing because that means that we must have a fault somewhere in there. We're going from Cretaceous to Triassic and Jurassic back to Cretaceous and Paleocene. Unless it's just possible, bear with me on this one, the highway department might have made a mistake. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 So what I want to do is, after I finish fishing here a little bit, the light's starting to get a little bit bright, the fish are slowing down, I'm going to take a drive back out to the highway, take a look at that outcrop, see if I can differentiate anything in it that suggests whether it is or is not Triassic and Jurassic windblown sand, is suggesting it's a nugget formation. Let's find out by actually looking at the sediments and the trace fossils, if any. Come with me if you're so inclined. If not, I totally understand. I'm gonna go do it anyway. What have you got to lose? You might as well come along. So this outcrop behind me is part of a succession of rocks that are dipping to the north. Flaming Gorge Dam is back behind me. I'm just north of Antelope Flat Campground, and I stayed the night just in that area. So as I'm driving north towards Rock Springs, I'm going up section because all the rocks are dipping to the north. So I'm getting progressively younger and younger. And in fact, when I look on the uh, Rock D app, it tells me that these outcrops behind me are the Erickson Formation, part of the Mesa Verde group. So if you see my video on the Mesa Verde in Wyoming around Sinclair, you know that it's basically the same here where it's going from marine to non-marine, it's going from shore faces and tidal deposits up into fluvial. And the Eric's information is largely fluvial channels with some estuarine deposits in it. So when Rock D tells me that this is the Ericsson, I buy it. And in fact, when I'm driving here and using my own interpretive skills, I would say, huh, this kind of looks like a fluvial succession of the Eric's information. So what is the controversy? We're about to go find out. It's on a highway sign just to the north of me here. I should have mentioned, I'm actually in Wyoming right now. This outcrop pretty much marks the boundary of Utah that way and Wyoming to the north. So the toe of the outcrop is essentially the border between Utah and Wyoming. Here it is, here's our dilemma. The highway sign is informing us that these outcrops, the ones right back there and the ones directly in front of me here, are Triassic to Jurassic Nugget Sandstone ancient desert sand dunes. So it's implying that they're older, that there's been some kind of fault 
separating the younger Cretaceous from these older rocks, and that these are desert Aeolian deposits. Let's take a look at the rocks, uh, because remember, if they're Aeolian, they should have very discrete features typical of Aeolian deposits. If they're, as I suspect, and has been mapped fluvial, um, Cretaceous fluvial, we should see some fluvial signatures in there. So let's take a look at the facies, the sedimentary structures, Probably not much in the way of trace fossils in either fluvial or aeolian, but we'll look at the sedimentary structures and the grain size and sorting and so on and see if we can make a decision about how accurate the sign is versus the app and some other maps. All right, just in the first five seconds of looking around, I spotted this in a talus block. Look at this. There's plant stems. There's rip-up clasts of um, siltstone, mudstone, all the kind of goodies you expect in a fluvial channel lag deposit which is at the base of a channel when all the material gets dumped in during a flood and you get ripped up chunks of um, overbank, you know, that have collapsed in. You get plant stem fragments that have come in with the floods. Not really common to see this in Aeolian deposits. Um, there's also, ooh, hey, look at this. I literally just spotted this. This is a sandstone with what looks like treatolites. This could be treatolites borings, shipworms, they're called shipworms or actually bivalves. They're bivalves that bore into wood and they used to bore into the old ships that were made of wood. That's why they're called shipworms. But they have a long body that looks like a worm. So they're a clam whose valves, the shell, has adapted into pinching, chewing, scraping, biting um, organs. And the body itself of the clam looks like a worm. So it looks like a worm with parrot beaks, but it's actually a bivalve. And this is a pretty convincing example of the type of burrows they make. The wood would have been gone. It's, it's rotted away, but it's leaving behind that oxidized color. But the casts of the treatolites borings, and they're called treatolites because they're made by uh, modern bivalves of the genus Teredo. So treatolites. Okay, so again, not something you'd expect in a desert. So more consistent with a fluvial deposit that's got some marine influence, maybe an estuary. Same as this. Let's see what else we see. Here's another section that's pretty consistent with being a fluvial channel belt system as opposed to Aeolian sand dunes. And I'm saying that because you can see what looks like repeated scours in the sand and each one is lined with fine grained mud. And it's got another thick package of sand and another scour lined with mud. Um, typically, especially in tidal deposits, like the treatolites would indicate we're looking at, um, the tidal dunes in the channel um, usually sit on top of a base of lag of fluid mud. So in estuaries and tidal channels, you usually have fluid mud at the base, then a bundle of sand, a scour, and a fluid bundle of a uh, fluid package of mud, and then more sand. Kind of looks like that's what we're seeing here. And you can see these cross beds are kind of uh, all sorts of angles. There's some steep ones, some shallow ones. Not consistently steep like you would expect in Aeolian deposits. These are very low angle. Um, looks like they might even have some mud drapes on them. So that mud draping is you know, indicative of tidal deposits. So we've got marine trace fossils. We've got mud draping on shallow dipping forsets. We've got a lot of fluid mud at the base of channels. I think we're pretty safe in saying this is not Aeolian. And it's probably not the Jurassic to Triassic. I think we're in the Eric's information here, folks. Okay, well, that was kind of interesting. We saw how with just a couple of minutes of looking around and checking out trace fossils, checking out um, sedimentary structures and grain size, you can get a pretty good feel of what this rock or any rock you're likely to encounter, what it actually represents in terms of depositional environment. I didn't think there was gonna be any trace fossils in here because the Eric's information is generally interpreted to be mostly fluvial, but we've got treatolites and we got what looks like could be tidal deposits, not inconsistent with, you know, rivers empty out into estuaries and bays and um, environments like that. So this is probably a, a lower coastal plain stretch of a fluvial section. We see scours, we see dunes, and some marine trace fossils. Consistent with the context, remember all the rocks are dipping north, consistent with the sedimentary and trace fossil data. I hate to say it, but in this case, the highway department, the highway sign is wrong. This is not Triassic and Jurassic, certainly not ancient Aeolian sand dunes, and not the Nugget Sandstone by any stretch. This is the Eric's information. So 
hey, highway department, if you're watching, maybe come out and change this sign. If not, everybody that watches this video will now know you can't trust everything you read on the side of the road.